So thank you for being here and welcome to this uh, uh, lunchtime seminar of the uh, UNESCO Chair in Global Citizenship Education at the University of Bologna. This is a series of seminars we organize on a regular basis, uh, presenting books, uh, opening discussions in different topics related to global citizenship education and related issues. Uh, today, we are very much uh, happy and enthusiastic to host this uh, book launch uh, on a book of value creating education teacher perception and practice. Uh, technically, this book is not uh, immediately related to the terms of global citizenship education, but I know that in the content of this book and the various contributions we are going to listen to in the next few um, minutes, uh, the topic of global citizenship education, I'm sure it is uh, at war of the educational practice uh, um, you are uh, going to, uh, to, to present uh, today. Emiliano, the floor is yours. All right. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, uh, depending on where you're located today, and greetings from Tokyo, Japan. Uh, let me begin by thanking the UNESCO Chair in Global Citizenship Education in Agri Education at the University of Bologna and Massimiliano Tarozzi for hosting this virtual book launch Value Creating Education, Teachers' Perceptions and Practice. My name is Emiliano Bossi, a professor of global education based in Japan, and I have authored and co-authored multiple scientific articles in the field of global citizenship, uh, critical, transformative, ethical, values-based pedagogy, uh, collaborating with scholars such as Carlos Alberto Torres, Henry Giraud, Youssef Agdid, Peter McLaren, and others. Uh, some of my recent books include Conversations on Global Citizenship Education in Routledge, Global Citizenship Education in the Global South by Brawl, and The Emergence of the Ethical Engaged uh, University in Springer. International journal publications include Exploring Values and Knowledge in Global Citizenship Education with William Gaudelli and Carlos Alberto Torres, Ethical Global Citizenship Education with Dan Shuttle, and Critical Pedagogy and Global Citizenship Education with Harry Giro. Currently, I'm guest editing with Youssef Vakdid and Silke schreib Schraps, a new special issue in the UNESCO International Review of Education on the theme of philosophical, ethical, and pedagogical perspectives on global citizenship education, a critical examination with educators from South to North. So if you're interested in this topic, please feel free to get in touch. Let me also briefly mention that uh, I'm the editor of the Global Citizenship Education video interview series. This interview series on global citizenship is publicly available on YouTube, and the series has featured over 50 scholars worldwide, including James Banks from University of Washington, Betty Lee's Latrobe University, Samuel Merginson, Oxford University, and Anne David, Boston College in the United States. And so the Global Citizenship Education interview series provides a video roadmap to relevant experiences in global citizenship in agri education and uh, beyond. It aims to be a valuable resource uh, for three groups of viewers at least, educators seeking to integrate their theoretical understanding of global citizenship into teaching practices, researchers new to global citizenship looking for dynamic starting points, for their research, but also general viewers interested in learning more about the history, philosophy, and practice of uh, global citizenship. And so this webinar today, marking the launch of our book, Value Creating Education, is given by a scholar myself based in Japan who has collaborated with academics worldwide, including those in both the global north and the global south. And for instance, my experience includes working with scholars in countries such as South Africa, Tanzania, Trinidad and Tobago, Malawi, Ghana, um, India, Zimbabwe, Mexico, Jordan, the United States, the United Kingdom, Israel, Canada, Brazil, Italy, South Korea, China, and uh, Japan. And so in many ways, uh, therefore, the book Value Creating Education uh, is shaped by the valuable insights from numerous scholars who participated in my interview series on uh, global citizenship. 
Today, we have an excellent and diverse audience, and therefore I will focus on three core points. First, how the idea of the book Value Creating Education developed and how it is conceptualized. In other words, I will initiate a discussion aimed at answering the question, what is value creating education? And then I will briefly discuss the book's key themes. And afterward, I will delve into five key elements of value creating education as discussed in my chapter, Value Creating Education for Global Citizenship and Critical Consciousness Development, namely praxis, reflexive dialogue, caring ethics, humanity empowerment, and eco-critical perspective. I will conclude my talk by suggesting why the idea of a value-creating education is both necessary and powerful, along with a brief summary of the main points discussed today. Following that, my colleagues Maria Guayardo, Sara Wider, Monte Gioffi, Simon Hoffman, Vicky Mucuria, Lacrita Cicara, and Yame Goggins will speak. And finally, we will provide you with an opportunity to ask questions about the book Value Creating Education. So let me begin by addressing the question, what is value creating education? Value creating education has its roots in the Japanese concepts of soka value creating as put forward by the educator Tsunesapuro Makikuchi. His work was then developed by Japanese Buddhist philosophers, authors and peace advocates, Jose Toda and Daisaku Ikeda. Value creating education involves nurturing the capacity in students to create value in finding meaning in one's own existence and to contribute to the well-being of others. And so by extension, this promotes the teaching of values and knowledge that assist at least potentially all students, not only those situated in the global north and from wealthy families, with developing into emancipated and informed global citizens. And yet, there has been relatively little coverage on how educators throughout the globe perceive value-creating education as pedagogy and implement it in curriculum and classroom practices. And therefore, we approach this book as a way to present a remarkable collection of theoretically and practically grounded chapters from international recognized and emergent scholars located in the global south, for example, Brazil, Cuba, and Macau, and the global north, for example, the United States, Denmark, and Japan, sharing their perspectives about value creating in relation to research, teaching, and learning. And so the result is a robust pedagogical discussion that is open for deliberation and welcomes international educators and researchers to reflect critically on the possible implications of value creating education discourses. And so the book is designed with the intent to contribute towards the possibility of imagining a yet to be realized critical, humanistic, transformative, and value-creating pedagogical approach that looks farther than generalized Western outlooks on market-driven and apolitical strategies, favoring more ethical models drawn from principles of empathy, hope, creative living, mutuality, reflexivity, dialogue, critical consciousness, critical pedagogy, social emotional learning, leadership, human rights, and social justice development. And therefore, value creating education, as discussed by the scholars in our book, is not, and I repeat, is not a pedagogical approach that exists for a global elite. Instead, it is an ethical platform oriented towards social justice that offers all students, not just the rich ones in the global north, a meaningful way to examine our shared planet. Let me now briefly address the main themes of the book and its distinctiveness. As explored by educators located in both the Global South and the Global North within this book, value creating education is capable of connecting educators, students, and policymakers with a plurality of ethical principles, which we grouped into three main themes. T1, transformative change in consciousness, global citizenship, and sustainability through inner transformation, dialogic learning, and reflexivity in value creating education. Team two, value contribution to the educator, the community, and the system through value creating education. And team three, connecting humanity and pedagogy to challenges and possibilities in value creating education. And so this collection of value creating education chapters is distinctive in three different aspects. 
Firstly, although publications do exist focusing on value-creating education theory and practice, it is rare that the voices of educators embracing value-creating education are included in the literature or that distinctive pedagogical and theoretical approaches to value-creating education at the local levels are given detailed attention. Secondly, the chapters are written by senior and emergent scholars and practitioners who have a solid field experience as well as proficiency in value-creating education, international comparative education, and the philosophy of education. And thirdly, this book provides a variety of value-creating education applications from educational policy to professional development to teaching experiences. And so in its totality, value-creating education, as discussed in our book, is linked to key principles of sustainability, reflective dialogue, uh, but also students' critical consciousness development, civic accountability, social engagement, and inner transformation. While it would be challenging to explore all key principles, and my colleagues here today will add valuable inputs later, I will briefly focus on five key principles of value-creating education, which I discuss in chapter one of our book. So let me address the first element, praxis. Value-creating education assists students with ethical action and reflection. Freire describes developing a critical consciousness as requiring critical reflection and action upon the world to transform it. And so adopting a value-creating education approach which utilizes praxis stresses the need for value-creating education to achieve a robust emphasis on nurturing learners' familiarity with leading societal issues and societal questions, including prejudice, poverty, malnutrition, unemployment, and elitism. Let me address the second element, reflexive dialogue. When it comes to merging critical reflection and action praxis in value-creating education, reflexive dialogue provides a tool with which such a process can be conducted effectively in the classroom setting. So reflexive dialogue in relation to value-creating education should be viewed as a means of students' collective, reciprocal, and transformative self-analysis. And here we, the educators, implement reflexive dialogue as a pedagogical tool to support learners to become familiar with exploring their own ethics and morals with a collaborative and respectful classroom environment aimed at fostering wisdom, courage, and compassion. Let me address the third element, caring ethics. Caring ethics involves fostering the whole person emotionally, intellectually, and spiritually. In taking on this challenge, value-creating education includes prominent ethical dilemmas. For example, individual versus community, justice versus mercy. And within its teaching and learning material, educators can advance political and social contradictions characterizing our societies in a way that stimulates students' critical consciousness. They discuss, for example, a proactive approach to matters of social justice, harmony, and equality. Let me address the fourth element, empowering humanity. I believe that empowering humanity requires value-creating education to open a path for the personal improvement of every student, not only those who are white, rich, and located in the global north. Value-creating education must therefore emphasize an interpersonal dimension that recognizes the human drive to live harmoniously and responsibly with others, and here others as a capital O. And lastly, let me address the fifth element, eco-critical perspectives. Value-creating education encourages ecological consciousness and supports learners to examine the injustice created by humanity's perception that it is the supreme being on earth. And so by swapping out ego for eco, we can move the focus away from a human-centric attitude. Therefore, one of the objectives of value-creating education is to foster in our students what I call an eco-ethical consciousness that considers the environmental and social impacts caused by human decisions as effectively 
indivisible. So let me conclude with this question. Why is the notion of value creating education both powerful and needed? The notion of value creating education is both powerful and needed because it seeks to address a central question. What knowledge and values should educational institutions promote to shape new form of ethics and new thinking about society and communities. In answering this question, the contributions put forward by the excellent scholar in this book suggest that value-creating education, at least potentially, must promote a reorientation of learners' responsibility towards an orientation that adheres to the belief that knowing without acting is insufficient. And I will repeat this again, Knowing without acting is insufficient. We might have underestimated ethical values in academia, and yet ethical values are, or at least should be, a key part of our pedagogy, teaching, and research. One of the key suggestions that emerge from the valuable perspectives offered by the excellent educators in this book is that discussions on value-creating education should find a special place in our pedagogical deliberations. Indeed, value-creating education, as discussed in this volume and in its ethical essence, raises questions not only about the meaning of ethical knowledge and values themselves, but also brings into view matters of the purposes of education and the kinds of human beings that education seeks to develop in the 21st century, the era of globalization. Thank you for listening, and next, Maria will speak. Thank you so much, Emiliano. Um, and I think that you've provided the foundation for us to move forward and identifying those key elements. As you suggested, one of those key elements is dialogue. And so I will be saying a few more words about that. As I thought about how do I begin to go deeper with, with dialogue and dialogic learning, I thought I'll approach it from three different aspects. What is the purpose of dialogue? What is the process? of dialogue. And then third, what is the practice? Because as Emiliano shared, while value creating education has had a very strong foundational push, the big question, the million dollar question is, what does it look like in real life? What does it look like at the micro level, at the community level, at the organizational level, in terms of policy and with one another? In terms of purpose, dialogue is transformational. And I believe that when we really hold on to this concept of transformation, we then begin to see that dialogue is more than a transactional activity. As Paulo Freire said, dialogue is not ping pong. It's not a process of you talk, I talk, you talk. That's transactional. Dialogue is not uh, waiting for someone to stop talking so that then you can respond, right? We, we have to begin to reconsider what dialogue is. So in terms of purpose, I would suggest to you that value creating education says that dialogue is a transformative process, that in fact, it is a process for becoming more human. And isn't that the fundamental essence of education? How can we learn to become more human? How can we present our best self? As Emiliano shared the, the definition or criteria for value creating education, it's about how we emerge our best selves in relationship to others in order to also contribute to them. So the purpose of dialogue is transformation. So then what would I say about the process? Well, the process is, in fact, very relational, but what I love is that we have to take a step back and understand that it requires inner preparation. And what do I mean by that? That inner preparation means that as we approach dialogic learning, we begin to self-reflect, we begin to deepen our own sense of self-awareness and ability to embrace new knowledge for the purpose of then taking action or engaging in praxis. So that inner preparation then allows the, the process of dialogic learning to increase one's sense of belonging, one's sense of agency. It's the idea that 
in this relationship of dialogue, dialogue or dialogic learning, you in fact are seen by the other. And that is a powerful experience in education. When you are seen and you allow yourself to be seen by the other. So dialogic learning is a process that occurs between students, between the educator and students, and between educators. And again, someone asked me recently, well, what are some of the myths around value creating education? And I think one of the myths is that there's a package curriculum that we can run to the bookstore or to the textbooks and, and pull off the shelf. I would suggest to you that as we approach value creating education through dialogue, it is an experience. Dialogic learning is an experience. And so then I move on to practice. So what would this practice look like? First and foremost, it's the ability to listen, to understand. Here in Japan, our academic year began. Uh, and for us at Soka University, it began this week. And yesterday I had my first class with my democracy and social justice students. There were 30 human beings all crowded into a room that was too small. So we had to share desks and chairs and there we all, all were. And after having discussed some basic concepts of democracy and social justice, I then said, now we're going to practice dialogue. And I asked students to reflect on what early childhood experiences impacted their worldview today. Because learning from a value creating education connects to our environment, it has to be relevant. And so students then engaged in dialogue and the way we practice it in the classroom, because again, purpose, process and practice, the way we practice is that you get to listen in this instance for three minutes without saying a word. You listen to your partner for three minutes as they share their response or reply to this, to this prompt. At the end of this exchange, where one listens and one speaks and then the other speaks and one the other listens, I asked the students how much they had learned about their partner. And across the room, everyone said, I had no idea how much you could learn in three minutes. And so I'm just going to close my remarks by saying, dialogic learning is this process of vulnerability, of personalization, where we allow ourselves to be seen. And imagine if this happened in classrooms globally. Imagine if it happened in our families, right? Because I don't think value creating education is just for the classroom. It's for who we are as individuals in relationship with one another. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think uh, next uh, we have uh, uh, Simon. Simon, if you could speak. All right. Hello, everyone. Greetings from uh, Madrid, Spain. And uh, good to see everyone. Thank you, uh, Emiliano and Maria, for hosting uh, the, the volume that uh, I was honored to contribute to and to Massimiliano for hosting the, the event. And it's also just so wonderful to see old uh, familiar faces, to see Monty and, and Sarah Wider, who I haven't seen since my early student days on, um, on campus at Soko University of, of America, from whom I learned so much. So this is really uh, very wonderful and moving. Uh, I'm going to try to be short and concise here now. Uh, I'm only one half of a, of a chapter uh, together with uh, Gonzalo Obeyedo. Uh, we have uh, um, authored this uh, chapter in the book called The Phenomenology of Reflection and Expertise in Value Creating Education. Uh, Gonzalo is, is much, much more knowledgeable than me when it comes to, to uh, value creating education. He's actually one of the, of the world's leading uh, experts on this, I would uh, dare to say. Um, uh, he's he's working in in uh, in Chicago uh, in the in the Daisaku Kita Research Center on the same uh, topics, um, and uh, and I got in touch with Gonzalo for him to uh, to help me to combine uh, different research interests to understand something about value creating education. My own background uh, since I graduated from uh, the Soko University of America in two thousand eight was to go more into to classical phenomenology and also to study uh, musicians. So 
the background of this paper is uh, is about 20 years ago, Gonzalo and I, we were both uh, students in the first classes at the Soko University of America, and we were just constantly asking each other, and many of you who happen to be in this room, what is this thing that we call Soko education? None of us knew, and no matter how much we read of uh, Makiguchi or uh, Ikeda, we still didn't understand what it was. And so for 20 years, Gonzalo and I, we have been discussing uh, this, and uh, we have produced many more questions than we have produced answers. But for sure, uh, we came to a point where we got this invitation and we said, well, let's do an investigation together and see what we can do. So instead of being uh, hyper philosophical and discussing grand concepts, let's look at the practices of educators uh, and see what it, and try to understand the nature of value creating education in that way. So. Um, so we thought, well, let's not only look at at um, at uh, teachers of value creating, uh, of value creation, in various uh, institutions, but let's let's look at some of the experts, uh, some of those who have taught for a very long time, because maybe they have um, a clear understanding of of uh, of what it means to to uh, to teach or to embody a value creating education. So. Um, so therefore, we we chose to uh, to interview um, uh, three teachers. It was during the the pandemic, so we were doing it on on Zoom, sitting in many different time zones, uh, and it's a pretty challenging uh, empirical uh, kind of work. I can just uh, add to you that that there was a, a theoretical add on to this investigation, because not only is there a question about what is it that uh, value creating education is, but there's also an ongoing question uh, about what is the nature of expertise? What does it mean to be an expert? Uh, and that's a, a discussion uh, that I know something about because that's uh, that has been a, an ongoing discussion, especially in, in the US um, since the, the 70s um, with a, a phenomenologist like Hubert Dreyfus being very influential in, in that debate. And Hubert Dreyfus basically claims, well, true experts, uh, they are so good that they don't have to think about what they're doing as they're doing it. They're just doing it in the flow, on the fly, without thinking whatsoever. And if they start thinking, then they will uh, impede uh, the nature of uh, their expertise. They will no longer be experts. And I have, in the context of musicians, been exploring whether that claim is true. Uh, and it's not actually uh, entirely true that the claim. It has a lot going for it, but it's not entirely true. And so we wanted to see, well, what is the, the nature of uh, value create? What is the practice of value creating education? Uh, and what it constitutes the expertise in this case? What, what, are, what are the practitioners doing when they are teaching? So we had uh, three uh, uh, Zoom interviews uh, using a, a, a methodology that I have helped to develop that we call a phenomenological interview. We do in-depth qualitative interviews, and then we analyze them using theories from classical phenomenology or philosophy of mind, or in this case, also philosophy of education. We had uh, three expert teachers, I would say, from uh, current uh, faculty members at the Soga University of America, uh, who had respectively 21, 30, and then uh, under 10 years of teaching experience, uh, not necessarily just at that institution, but also at other liberal arts uh, colleges. And we uh, positioned uh, the, the two with substantially more uh, teaching experience, kind of in, in a counter position to the one with, uh, with less than 10 years, and we can see some interesting differences. Mm. They are. Uh, they were teachers of physics, uh, psychology, and astronomy. Um, let me just say a little bit about what we found. I cannot exhaust the the chapter. Obviously, it was very very interesting to interview these uh, three uh, teachers. It was a great pleasure to hear their thoughts about what they're doing, not so much their opinions about what constitutes soca or value creating education, but what do they actually do in the classroom? And that's what this uh, interview can do. It can zoom in on uh, practices very thoroughly and expert practices in particular. So some of the themes that we have uh, in the in the first round of analysis from, from uh, is about three times uh, 80 minutes of interviews. We have uh, emerging themes are something like the importance of emotions in learning, of making connections, um, of mindful interaction, and also flexibility in teaching. From another, we have the importance of experiential learning, aesthetic learning, responsiveness, creating a community, and of human transformation. I think all of these themes, they relate back to the, to the two first talks we have, uh, we have heard. Let me give you a little quotation from the professor of, uh, of astronomy. I took all my students off to Thailand. On a field trip, we went to Chiang Mai and we went up the mountains and we used their telescope. 
And along the way, we took fantastic photos of the night sky, pictures of galaxies, and all these students did amazing research projects. It's just a very short quotation. So there's something about using the power of aesthetics, the power of emotions to infuse your own learning and get a lot more out uh, of it rather than just learning uh, simple theories uh, or basic content. So I'm going to just uh, conclude because I cannot possibly say everything that's in the chapter. I hope that we will have a chance to, to read it. Uh, but basically saying that after we have done the, the qualitative phenomenological analysis, we have kind of two main conclusions uh, as, to, um, as to what we can say about the teaching practice of these particular three uh, professors. We cannot say for certain that it uh, encapsulates you know, the essence of value creating education, but it may be a good starting point or a good stepping stone for, for uh, creating more robust insights or theories about what actually constitutes the practice or the nature of value creating education. So the, of these two, the first one is something like the following. The faculty, they want to teach more than content. Uh, the students, they are to engage and respond with emotional, existential and aesthetic aspects of their learning and to make connections between what they learn and their own situated existence. That's the first one. The second one is uh, something that we have called flexibility which is that uh, teaching in a way that purposefully transcends a knowledge transfer model and instead values these aforementioned connections. And this requires teachers that are attuned to their students as whole human beings and encourage them to find their own meaning points of resonance with the material that's being taught. Teaching through such attunement again requires flexibility and an ability to adjust course content on the fly while teaching it in response to the individual students expressed or unexpressed needs. So those are some of the, of the main findings. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to hear uh, what many of the, of the following uh, authors have, have found. So thank you so much from Gonzalo Obriero and myself. All right, thank you, Simon. This is a lovely uh, report on the highlights of your chapter. Next, Sarah Wider will speak. Thank you for joining us, Sarah. It is my delight to be here, and I am just filled with gratitude and, oh my heavens, to be able to see you, Simon, after all those years that are still so memorable. My visit to Soka University of America and indeed being first introduced, and thanks to Masao Yokota, who many of you know, um, it was like a homecoming for me. Um, you know, I became a teacher not because I necessarily wanted to become a teacher, but what else do you do when you love learning, right? And where I taught for many years, Colgate University, it's a good place, right? But it also really smacks of the competitive and of the exclusionary and of a model of education that I, in some ways, my, my students coined this phrase, punitive, um, where you feel like the only way you can succeed in that is almost like a zero sum game. And that was just disappointing and disillusioning. I had wonderful professors in college that modeled different ways of learning, but, you know, I was pretty much within a framework that was not a value creating framework, you might say. And so when I learned about Soka education, when I learned about um, what those possibilities were, and I love what um, you have said, Simon, about, you know, the more you read about it, the more, you know, it's like, and, and also Maria, you know, there's no prepackaged curriculum. And this is very much relational and understanding in the moment. And so when um, Emilio and Maria asked me to contribute um, a preface, and it's very, you know, my, my, my contribution is very small in this way. I am just so glad to have been able to be part of this in some, in, in that way, that I was delighted to be able to support in whatever way, in how many ways we possibly can to bring this kind of learning to all classrooms and also Maria, as you said, to the family, to every place in which we are engaged. Because it is, of course, about the relational. It's about being able to value that moment and to be in that moment with others. Um, you know, not the transactional, not for what you're going to get out of it, but for what we are building together. Um, one of my joys also in being connected with this community is that understanding of that we are indeed creating peace in every moment, that that is what we are called to do and that is what we can do, and really understanding 
piece in a way that, uh, again, if I go to you, what you were saying, Emilio, is decentering the ego and placing the eco at that part, um, because we are all in this world together. Uh, we are also together with those who have gone before us, with those who will come after us, and we are distinctly placed. I mean, today I look out on my world here in upstate New York, um, the home of the Haudenosaunee peoples, and I see the trees, I see the grass, I see the ways in which our planet itself both has changed because of course we can see what's happening in the here and now with climate change, but we also see that um, vibrance. And if I were to quote Mr. Akeda, I would say in his repurposing or reintroducing texts that were very old, that yes, winter always turns to spring. And while our moment right now feels I don't even want to call it wintry because winter has the beauties of itself. But as we all know, we are in a dire time. Um, and perhaps the times have always been dire, but the pressures on us feel enormous. And so how do we respond to those pressures? How do we live within these pressures in a creative and both exuberant and joyful way? Because we need to bring joy to a hurting world. And of course, I come back to the value creating. I come back to the relational. I come back to what it was like if I go back those years, Simon, with you and sitting together with your classmates or sitting in that kind of transformative dialogue as we think about what we can do together. Maria, I think about being in your class that, you know, was a light um, at that moment and, and continues to be a light today, watching your students in that practice of transformative dialogue. And I also think about the ways in which we allow ourselves to be open to change and to also be open to all dimensions of creativity. And I guess that's where I will end my remarks for now, again, with gratitude, but also with invitation that we are all creative beings. And I want us all to think about how we support our own creativity, um, but also especially creativity with others. Um, and so again, my thanks to all of you for this volume and may it continue. Right, thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. This, this was very, very interesting. It comes from your heart, we can tell. Uh, next, uh, um, Monte. Monte will speak. Monte Joffi, if you could uh, unmute yourself. Thank you. Yes. Uh, hi, everybody. And thank you very much for everyone to join us. And uh, let me especially thank our brave editors, Dr. Bosio and Guajardo, uh, who can see this project. And I can barely imagine the amount of work that you went through just to know each other must have been so hard and to uh, continually adjust thoughts and cross-cultural bounds and uh, academic barriers and uh, just amazing. Not only that, to publish in UK, that, that must have been a whole new world in and of itself. Um, but what I would like to talk about uh, is both uh, global citizenship education and value creation education as not being add-ons, not something extra, a little bit of extra sauce on top of the dish, but um, but how they could how they could in particular global citizenship education how it could be seen as something that is right in front of us and in terms of education how it lives inside the classroom and how it lives inside the uh, experiences of our students teachers and parents so um, you know uh, out of all the wonderful wonderful readings and I think everyone agrees this is not a one time read. This is something, this is a book that you come back to again and again and again. Um, there were so many wonderful stories there, but the one person who seems to come back to my mind is um, someone who was called uh, Ms. D by uh, Dr. Mercurius. She was the pioneer of value creative education in Brazil. And she continues to participate in this volunteer program Despite her age and arthritic hands, she gets on that bus and she manages to touch the hearts of teachers who really don't want to be part of professional development. 
And I think this granular micro effort is at the heart of value creative um, value creative uh, education. She tells the story of her first exposure to uh, entering a literacy classroom, and she saw their terribly demoralized students and terribly uh, dissociated uh, teachers. And she saw, uh, she was able to walk away with that somehow with a resolve to change it. And so she did touching almost a million people in the process. Uh, in my case, my entry into the teaching profession was not easy. I was actually fired uh, two times and almost three times. And uh, unfortunately, I was dealing with undiagnosed depression at the time. And despite my best intentions and hard work, I couldn't figure out the important uh, classroom management piece of teaching. The kids could see myself, who, who I was actually, lacking authenticity, vision, and inner strength. Uh, so I have no regrets about being fired. I did deserve to, and I was forced to work at the bottom of the food chain as a substitute teacher. And there, every day, I walked into a fresh new uh, classroom, and I had the chance to try on different costumes. I saw wonderful teachers along the way, and I didn't have to live with the mistakes that I made that day. And it gave me the opportunity to actually learn how to teach, despite my dissociative dis uh, personality, because I did see I had one gift which was a strong and intuitive understanding of curriculum. So I built my career on that one talent. But my question was and remains, why is it so hard? Shouldn't it be easy? Also, why was I left alone in that classroom with just um, a set of keys and some chalk? Where was the community to help me succeed? And I think that still exists, those questions. About 15 years later, I won uh, an award that was called then the Citibank Teacher of the Year Award. So I went from fired to admired, but also I grew inspired because at that time I entered um, the late 70s uh, doctoral st studies at Teachers College, Columbia University. And there was a brilliant confluence of events. Uh, one of my teachers was named Arno Balak. And he was just beginning the science of studying what actually is teaching. Uh, then there were people like Ann Lieberman, Gary Griffin, and Karen Zumal who began to work, look into the world of the teacher from their perspectives and sights and ears. Uh, there was also the second wave of school reform that began to see possibilities existing in the family and communities and in uh, school people themselves and not just in the systems. And it was at a seminar there that my advisor, uh, Francis Scoopmaker, uh, actually got us reading John Dewey. Yes, we, I went through a whole doctoral program without reading John Dewey, but she made us read him. And the idea actually for what's now known as the Renaissance Charter School was born right at that little table. And I could remember it as if it was yesterday. But at that time, there were hardly any materials about value creative education, at least in the English language. But in 1973, Dale Bethel's Makaguchi, The Value Creator, was first published. Unfortunately, there was no uh, pipeline then to obtain it. Could you imagine life without Amazon.com? So somehow in the late 1970s, a copy came into my hands, and I remember pouring over it and beginning to think of, okay, what do I do as a value creator? And I began to match theory with practice. And right at that time, there was another incident of confluence because New York City Board of Education realized internally that it frankly did not know how to solve the crisis in its schools and how to uh, create, uh, reach out to the community for possible solutions. So I was able to find other people who were interested in value creative education. We began brainstorming what would a creative uh, education school look like in a secular world. We submitted a grant and somehow what is now known as the Renaissance Charter School was born. And I served as a school leader for 14 years. We were very, very high in ideals, but very lacking in practical skills. We floundered and somehow we found the uh, inner resources to surmount one challenge after another. 
But that brought me back to my original question. Why was it so hard? Shouldn't it be easy? In the year 2000, Daisaku Ikeda worried about, in his education proposal, what he called the flight from learning, which he saw as being a universalized um, phenomenon. Why are kids running away from education? Again, why is it so difficult? Why have they become hardened? Why are the uh, tools of the toolkits of teachers um, bare, bare and thin? What could we possibly do? Uh, so at this point, um, I went from becoming uh, a teacher trying to figure out how to make a classroom work to a principal, how to make a school work. And then uh, several years later, I retired. And then my quest began, became, how could we um, actually make a school system work? So uh, let, me, let me move on uh, to that question right now. I got uh, very close to uh, one uh, individual whose name was T. Willard, Scare, uh, T. Willard Fair, excuse me. And he was actually the CEO and uh, president of the Urban League of Greater Miami. He was there third, 60 years and still is there leading that movement. Could you imagine reform at one perch for 60 years? His vision was to turn this very, very poor and impoverished area of Miami called Liberty City into what he called an educational village. He stood his ground. Um, believe it or not, Abbott Elementary School exists throughout the United States. And he was the one who said the only thing lacking in his community was the will to achieve. So how could we build a, a system based on the will to achieve within the hearts of children instead of a top-down reform? So he and I began to look at school reform efforts in the United States, and we found out that school achievement has not moved uh, the needle of a, of, uh, since 1971. We went into the work of James Coleman, who in 1966 uh, found out that the bottom line for, for students' achievement lie in the quality of families, communities, and peer groups. And we had a nation refusing to have the brave and honest conversations that we need to look into the uh, structural inequity and figure out how to deal with them because they're not going away. A uh, Frieri would call our current school system a quote unquote limit situation. It has reached a dead end. And Hoon said that situations like this demand a paradigm shift. And I believe this is where value creative education can play an enormous role. So Mrs. D in Brazil remained hopeful despite the darkness surrounding her and we have to remain bright and optimist, optimistic despite the grave situation we find ourselves in. And to all of the uh, people in the Southern uh, world, please, we need yourself now more than, more than you could ever imagine. The Northern role, world has actually pretty much lost its ethos and we need to move into a new dimension. Anyway, so please um, enjoy the chapter. And I hope uh, you can join me in thinking about what a new paradigm would look like. Thank you. Thank you, Monte. Thank you. Next, we will have Vicky and Alacrita. If you can unmute yourself, thank you for joining us. Yes, thank you so much. And thank you, Dr. Jaffe, for that wonderful setup. And it's a great honor to be here. Buongiorno, buonsera from Dallas, Texas. Um, I am here together with my beloved colleague and friend. Uh, you want to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you so much, everyone. We're very honored to be part of this esteemed uh, panel and also to be uh, included in this wonderful edited collection. I am Alankrita Chikara, and I'm tuning in from Southern California. So um, I am so excited to share with you all about our research um, through uh, just a unusual set of circumstances. I learned Portuguese when I was 16 and I've been to Brazil several times. Uh, Alan Crete and I met as graduate students uh, after retiring from teaching in public schools in Dallas for over 25 years. I went and got another master's and PhD and that's how Alan Crete and I met. And we both um, have 
a passion about caring and education, which led us to go to Brazil. So I'm just gonna read very briefly a summary of our chapter. It prevent, presents the findings from a study on educação soca in ação called Soca Education in Action. It is a unique volunteer-led continuous professional development initiative for public school teachers in Brazil. And these volunteers go to the most challenging neighborhoods in Brazil. And when I was there, um, they didn't, I didn't have phone service in those neighborhoods. There weren't Uber drivers or taxis. It was challenging. Now this was formally called the Magaguchi Project in Action. And this decades long initiative is inspired by these volunteer educators understanding and application of Soka Kyoiku or value creating education. Um, we use narrative inquiry and this is considered an extrinsic study in the field of Soka studies or Ikeda studies. And what we sought to do was to elevate the voices as uh, Dr. Jaffe just did of these Brazilian volunteer educators who are part of this community-based teacher training project. They share their experiences of engaging with public school teachers who participate in their programs and the teachers describe themselves. And Alan Crete and I heard a teacher say she felt like she was drowning under administrative pressures. But when she had this professional development, she was left with hope. And I remember what one of our first professors taught us, the expression from Gramsci about pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the spirit. This was that embodiment, but it was using the principles of Soka education. And our findings revealed that the challenging economic, political, and social circumstances of the public educational system in Brazil served actually as a catalyst for the volunteers to seek ways to create value in education. And in turn, these volunteer educators developed practices to help public school teachers create similar value in all circumstances, even when their situations may appear as daunting obstacles. So um, I wanna end my section um, by this quote from Ikeda, why Brazil? Right. So in addition to my personal um, love of Brazil, um, Ikeda says that the Brazilian spirit alternates between darkness and light in a dizzying fashion that defies simple description. Nonetheless, I see in the Brazilian spirit a route to a great universalism that can replace the superficial one of modern society. So um, there's great universalism. There are more Japanese uh, outside of Bra Japan in Brazil than anywhere else. So it's a unique confluence of Brazil and Japan right there that come together through, um, like Monty Jaffe shared, through spirited and introduced through this amazing Ms. D. So Alan Krita, maybe you would like to share a bit about our research. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction, Vicky. And I think um, my quest for this work uh, really stems from having been in a school system in India where I was born and raised, uh, which was focused on rote memorization and in many ways transactional, and we did not experience uh, this relational or intentional education until actually I attended Soka University uh, for my undergraduate studies. And uh, it was uh, during my master's uh, that I returned for after having taught actually in a nonprofit um, program, uh, which was also an interesting experience because I got to see the impact of um, some of the Western um, economic logic really playing out in the ways curriculum was being designed and uh, scripted curriculum that I was expected to teach. And so um, I wanted to visit this concept of uh, a culture of care in education and really seeing uh, what are ways that alternative teacher preparation programs or alternative uh, professional development 
um, uh, experiences for teachers can allow for, um, you know, value creation to take place. So I think that was really the seed, you know, for this project. And like Vicky said, I think through classroom discussions and dialogues um, with our interests really converging uh, led us on this journey uh, to Brazil. And interestingly, my college roommate uh, was Brazilian. So I didn't speak Portuguese, but I actually had uh, the support of Vicky and my friend uh, who actually served as our uh, translator, you know, for uh, that three weeks uh, in Brazil, literally 24-7, uh, that allowed us uh, to conduct these interviews. Um, and as we share in the chapter, we actually have over 40 hours uh, of interviews during the first visit. And actually, um, there were subsequent interviews conducted uh, during um, uh, two following visits uh, by Vicky during her doctoral studies. And uh, I also want to take an opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Gula, who is the director um, at the DePaul University's um, La Sacoica Studies Center, because he offered input, you know, on our thinking, especially towards the, for this chapter. And uh, to also clarify uh, for those who are new to this field um, or to Ikeda Soka Studies of Value Creating Education, that the extrinsic branch uh, really focuses on the application of Makiguchi, uh, Toda, and Ikeda's ideas. So our work uh, was really seeing how um, the, the um, volunteer educators as part of Soka Education in Action uh, were really applying the teachings of Makiguchi, Toda, and Ikeda uh, in practice as volunteers uh, within public schools in Brazil. And so uh, for, for my section, I, we wanted to focus also on why we chose narrative inquiry as our methodology um, for analyzing the stories. And we really think uh, that narrative inquiry provides uh, an opportunity to reframe experiences. Um, so in a personal way, um, I actually utilized uh, narrative inquiry also to analyze some of my own experiences with caste discrimination and reframing that and creating value and making meaning from those experiences. And so uh, in writing the vignettes or the narrative images um, that we have provided in our chapter, including the story that uh, Monty mentioned uh, of Miss D, um, is reframing the experience of how this you know, challenging situation or poison uh, was really turned into medicine through the efforts of um, Miss D's efforts in the classroom, Miss D's effort uh, in the literacy program, and then leading um, her to really design and um, envision uh, this volunteer uh, professional development program that is part of Siduk um, also. Um, also, narrative inquiry really begins with the premise that we all lead storied lives. And so researchers as storytellers, um, you know, can can then really mine right for these stories and present the storied lives um, for continued dialogue and introspection for the reader and then also um, for the speaker themselves. So I think um, on many levels, the narrative inquiry approach started with um, Vicky and my, you know, exchange of stories as researchers on this project. Um, and then really embodying that um, heart and spirit in, in dialogue with our participants. And then as we were dra drafting these narrative images. And so thinking also about uh, Ikeda's ideas, um, you know, of making meaning and creating value through this exchange of ideas is what was really at the center of how uh, we used uh, the method for, for our chapter. Um, and also stories prevent us uh, from the belief that people are oversimplified and uh, generalizable. And so I think from our uh, from the vignettes that we provide also, I think it's reconfirming that um, individuals leave, re lead really rich uh, dynamic lives. And I think uh, um, as we are engaging with, as we engaged with, uh, you know, educators from Brazil um, who have this rich culture and background, I think it was an opportunity to present it in its um, full varied uh, diversity. So uh, that was, that's really, I think, I, yeah, I can uh, conclude our remarks here and uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have about the chapter. Thank you. All right, thank you, Lakrita and Vicky. Next is Yan. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, and I really appreciate the opportunity. And this has been a, a really wonderful project to be part of. Um, so, you know, I, I think I, I, am, I wrote chapter five, which is titled Creative Coexistence for Teacher Development in Value Creating Education, Giving Heart. 
Uh, I am a teacher educator at the City University of New York, and I work in the Bronx primarily, which is, uh, you know, alongside, in some ways, alongside my good friend, Monty Jaffe, who spoke earlier. So it's a real honor and a pleasure to have the Bronx represented here. Um, so the Bronx is, you know, I won't go into detail about the Bronx per se, other than to say that it is, a, you know, it is, is a part of the city that, you uh, in, of New York City that has a high rate of poverty, um, a lot of challenges, and I am primarily helping develop early service teachers who are, you know, going into that environment where there are incredibly high needs that they need to attend to with their students. And most of the teachers with whom I uh, work uh, are themselves from this neighborhood and from this community. So there's a real uh, sense of commitment to serving your community that come from, uh, you know, with the teachers that I, I serve. Prior to the current work that I'm doing right now, I did a, a lot of work with coaching uh, teachers and professional development. Uh, and that really was the inspiration for my chapter. Um, you know, it's it's like so many things have been said in this uh, meeting today so far uh, resonate with me and with my experience. Um, you know, this the idea of SOCA education being experiential, being an experience that we have, um, you know, a learning process that we go through with people and really, you know, what does creative coexistence look like, this concept of creative coexistence with respect to SOCA education. That's really, um, you know, been my focus and my interest. In my chapter, I, I you know, I, I outline, uh, I, I share several vignettes uh, with teachers that I worked with. Uh, and just share how I, I try through the vignettes. I don't draw any conclusions and I don't um, really make any overt interpretations of the events that I describe in the vignettes. But what I try to do is show, you know, almost in a, as if it's like looking at a video, you know, how my interaction with those teachers was a shared experience, uh, how we experience empathy together around the teaching, uh, you know, the teaching um challenges that they were facing that I was helping guide them with. So to kind of back up a little bit, um, keep myself focused here as I've got notes in front of me. Um, you know, I, one of the biggest things that has really impacted my thinking about teaching, you know, you know, in the last several years has been the pandemic and the move in New York City to uh, teaching online, teaching on Zoom. Uh, it was, it was, I was actually doing my dissertation work uh, for my PhD at that time. And a lot of my, my research involved working with high school students. And because of the pandemic, I was forced to do that over Zoom. And I was able to really observe the students' discomfort with being on Zoom, which just seemed to be universal with, with students. I, was able to be on Zoom classrooms in multiple schools across New York City and in New Jersey. And, you know, it, I, I would describe how students felt on Zoom as like being stuck in the middle of a bridge that's been broken off at both ends. Uh, they, they were they felt thrown into something that they had no control over. They, you know, you know they found themselves simultaneously in an unfamiliar social space while isolated from others. It was a very much a paradox, a paradoxical situation, being intensely socially connected while being alone. Um, so that really that really impacted my thinking of how do we how do we really you know create value together as a, in a communal sense. Um, in my chapter, I. You know, I I address the issue of of, of wellness and and self care that is very popular in, in 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 society right now, and I really challenge some of the understandings of mindfulness practices, where I really see uh, you know a lot of what has become popular and a trend is really actually not creating value together with others, but actually pulling yourself. out out. Um, what I, you know, some of the, you know, kind of almost what I'm calling decisive passivity in the face of difficulty, really finding, you know, like instead of challenging difficult circumstances with people, pulling away and, and isolating even more, uh, you know, unwittingly. Um, so that's a real concern. We have a, we're, we're in a very isolated place. People are, you know, we have, there's so much, you know, news and discussion now about the effects of social media, um, you know, I won't go into that because I think it's something we're all thinking about in many different ways all the time. But we we, we are we are living in an alien in an alienating time, um, and my concern is how can we adapt 
to the to the challenges that we face and how can we advance together um so you know there's a difference between you know compassion uh, and self-care, uh, you know, how do we, you know, how do we move beyond ourselves to connect with others and in so doing enrich ourselves and, and bring ourselves together. Um, Ikeda talks about the relational self, which I, uh, I, I discuss in my chapter. Uh, and I'll, just a quick quote from uh, Ikeda that was uh, cited by actually Dr. Gula. And the, the quote is, a relational self is the mark of real becoming of a true education born from endless realizations of what it means to be human. Uh, so I really take that to heart when I work with teachers in the field. My whole point with teachers is I don't have it all figured out. Um, I don't know, you know, I, you know, I, when I was a teacher in the classroom myself, I was very much alone. I didn't have very many, very, very few people gave me guidance or support or, you know, so I really keep that in mind when I work with teachers. Um, and so that being said, uh, just to kind of conclude here, um, you know, my interest is is really is is in how do you bridge that gap between uh, you know the teacher and the community they serve? How do you bridge that gap between yourself as an evaluator and a coach with a teacher? Um, and then how how do you help teachers get themselves into a place where they can effectively connect with their colleagues and with their students and continue to grow and not become you know, you know, stymied and stuck and unable to progress and ultimately burn out and give up. Uh, so those, these are some of my concerns. There's a lot of things I'm leaving out, but I, I would just conclude by saying that, you know, the way I work with teachers and what I describe in my chapter is going into, in, into the same process of, of self inquiry and shared inquiry with the teacher you're helping and doing that based on the wisdom, compassion, and courage that we talk about so often here uh, in Ikeda studies. Um, if you're, if, you know, if I'm motivated in that way where I'm really trying to reach people based on creating value together with them, uh, I've always found that I'm able to, to touch their heart. I'm able to connect with them in a valuable way and really create a lasting relationship from which both of us can grow and build together. So I'll just end with one, uh, just one line from my chapter. As our conversations unfold over time, I listen and I share from my own teaching experiences and I work with them to find solutions to problems for which neither of us may have complete answers. And that's the ethos that I try to keep going as I go through my work. And so I will end there and thank you again so much for this opportunity. Okay, thank you all of you for your uh, very interesting and inspiring presentations. And I particularly appreciated the diversity of the voices you raised because uh, they, first of all, geographically from Japan to Europe, the Denmark and Spain uh, to United States, and, and secondly, for different uh, perspectives, so from a teacher perspective, from more academic perspective, research perspective, teaching perspective. So it's something I, I particularly like, and I think uh, this is probably uh, one of the most important uh, points of, uh, of your edited book uh, that is, is a, provide a, a multifactorial, multi-perspective view on, on the topic of uh, value-creating uh, education.